Hey, Genevieve. Hey, love the poster. Thank you. So that actually brings me to my first question. I'm asking everyone: Grease one or Grease two? How, Grease one. How Grease dare one. you? <laughs> Ooh, Grease two. It's girlfriend. No what? <laughs> I love the dedication though. <laughs> Grease one or Grease two? One, two, three, go. One. Grease one. Mothership. <laughs> it's mothership. our mothership. The mothership. It's the, the founder the of everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we still love Grease two. But if we we had to pick, we, yeah, we got to go with one. The original. Grease one or Grease two? Ooh. Great question. I'm I'm a Grease one, and I'm an original. I You know, the performances from Olivia Newton-John and, and John Travolta are iconic, and the Truly set is still so for iconic. Me. Yeah. Grease one for me as well. Grease one, hands down, every single song. I'm like, oh, classic, oh, classic. classic. The yeah. dancing. So good. So good. The hair. No hate to Grease 2, though. We yeah. see the poster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we still mm -hmm. have it. Listen. Yeah. <laughs> She's unconvinced. <laughs> Grease 1 or Grease 2? I'm a classic Grease 1 yeah. girlie. Grease myself. 1. But you know, I see the Grease 2 poster in the back, so. Yeah! Grease Is that two? you, Grease yeah. 2? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love it. And so, your makeup is so. fire. Till death do us part, think pink. Grease 1 or Grease 2? <laughs> uh, Grease one for me. I mean, looking at your poster, I feel like uh -huh. I should probably Answer say wisely. Grease two. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. There you go. <laughs> so that's the way it's going to be now, huh, Miss Independent? Yeah, independent. I kiss who I want, when I want. Bitch, I am tier three, and the government tells me that I am very dangerous. For Cheyenne, um, can you share about the experience of doing Olivia's musical number? I believe it's called Sorry That I Distract You, where she gets to rally against this hypersexualization that everyone else projects onto her, because that was by far one of my favorite Olivia moments in the first five <gasps> Thank episodes. Thank you. I absolutely love that number. It is so much fun, and it was so much fun to do as well. Um, that classroom scene at the beginning, when just like everybody's just, bah, all like the hard moves. That's my favorite and, part. Yeah, it's yeah. so good. Um, but I mean, just being a part part of that number, it was, ugh. I remember seeing it too, and they gave us kind of like, okay, you're gonna be, when it goes into like the fantasy sequence, everything's gonna be in black and white, except your, your color green is gonna stay. And I was like, whoa, whoa, what? Yeah. And then all the boys, uh, I'm in charge, Everybody's behind me, you know? Yeah. That's Everybody's your ideal world. Yes. Right there, yeah. I'm in charge. <laughs> no, it was very empowering, too. Such a such an amazing moment. I love that number. Yeah, it's awesome. And as somebody that didn't get to be there on the day, so the first time I see it is just when it's edited in the episode, I was blown away. <laughs> amazing. I just thought it was also super important because there's this really a uh, negative stereotype of right. hypersexualizing Latin American women. So right. I just really appreciated like how all of that came together with that number. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, for Marissa, one of the most fascinating threads of Jane's story is that her Puerto Rican mother encourages her to hide her Hispanic heritage. Did you do any research into the older history of people's experiences, either generally speaking or in Hollywood specifically, of hiding their ethnicities or cultural backgrounds for safety or to get around discrimination? You know what? My father is Mexicano, and he, when he was growing up, he was going through school, and I heard stories about him and his experience of um, they did not call him by his by his Mexican name and gave him a white name, you know? And so things, even like the the um, impulse to hide was I feel like almost forced onto um, their generation as well, which is something that I was privy to even before getting this project. So yeah. I was very caught up to speed on what that must, obviously must have been like. And um, I, I love the dynamic between Jane and her mom for that reason of Jane being like, a little too innocent and be like, but why isn't it hard for people to, you know, we have to be proud of where we come from. And um, yeah, it is, it's really, I feel like people are gonna be able to re relate to Kitty as well. I think they're gonna wrap me soon. So I just wanna say congratulations on the series. I had a lot of fun watching it. I was ready to be a harsh critic if I felt it necessary, but it was really fun to see, you know, 
a more inclusive uh, addition to the Grease series, so even though glad. I do love this movie. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jamal, with this being a prequel series, did you pull anything from Patricia Birch's choreographic language to connect this series to the Grease films and stage musical, all of which she choreographed? And she also directed this masterpiece. Too. Absolutely. Of course I did. I mean, I felt like... I was a student of Patricia Birch, you know what I mean? Like just watching the, both of the films um, and being a fan of both of them. I'm actually a fan of both of them. I felt like because I knew every number, I, you know, uh, it was just already implanted in my body. And so when the choreography would come up, I would say, oh, this is Patricia, you know? And I would know kind of what her sensibility was. And yeah, so really this is like a big, love letter to her for me because uh, it, she did such beautiful work. Yeah. Justin, can you share a bit about how period accurate versus anachronistic the show's music was intended to be? And also, who wrote the lyric, those communist sluts showing people their butts? Because that was by far my favorite lyric of the first five episodes. I heard it and was like, oh, my people. So, um, yes. Um, uh... Well, first, first question um, to answer the first one. My blueprint was the was the original Grease, right? Which is very much a late seventies take of the fifties. There was a very current view of the fifties. Whether you had you know a Gibb writing Grease is the word, or you had Olivia Newton John's main songwriter coming in to write, you know, songs for it. So it was that was the blueprint of yes, fifties nostalgia has to be so important and I need to do my deep, deep homework on different inspirations from the fifties, but do not be afraid of current sounds because the original wasn't afraid of current sounds. So I shouldn't be either. Yeah. And then communist slut showing people their butts, um, <laughs> was, uh, I mean, I am, I co-wrote the songs with, with uh, lots of amazing people, wow. but I am the main lyricist in the situation. Lyrics are my favorite part of all music. So, um, most of the lyrics you're hearing uh, came from this brain. this terrifying brain. <laughs> <laughs> Jamal, how precise is the process of choosing camera angles for these musical numbers? Like, is it extremely precise or do you shoot for longer sequences so that there's a little bit more room to play when editing them all together? We were, we were extremely precise because we didn't have a lot of time to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, like I said, we were doing 10 musical musicals, you know, each episode felt like a real musical and there were four numbers. And so anyway, so we had to be precise and we had to plan shots for each sequence. And we really wanted to because like like West Side Story or we wanted to be able to hold up against those kind of things. And um, so, yeah, we they we killed planned. it. We planned. I had no part in it. So I can just say as an uh, outsider, they killed it. It was amazing to watch. It was incredible just how many musical numbers were fit into each episode. So I really don't know how you got all of that done. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know how they did it. Or no, how you did it. <laughs> it was like so many songs. 30 original songs, more than any TV show in history. Man. That sounds like a clip right there that just needs to be yeah. like the headline of marketing the show. <laughs> One thing I did want to mention before I run out of time, Justin, I actually met you a million years ago when Semi Precious Weapons was opening for Lady Gaga on tour at a meet and greet. So, like, this feels like a lovely full circle moment oh. because I love Greece, especially Greece too. So, I'm just very happy. And I love Drag Race Jamal. So, the fact that both of you are here working on this series feels like all of the stars have aligned to make this moment. <laughs> Thank That's you. Amazing. That is so, what's, Can I ask you a question? Okay, go, go, ahead. go. You go. What's your favorite song in Greece 2? Ooh, so I love the bowling. <laughs> But I also love reproduction because, like, the idea of uh, a formerly closeted um, Hollywood heartthrob from the 1950s singing during the 80s, during, like, the AIDS crisis, like, teaching sex education. There's, like, all of this unintended, like, yeah. weight behind that number. But it's also just hilarious because, like, <laughs> America in general has a weird thing about sex education for kids in public schools or just schools in general. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, what is the best time of the month for a woman to... <sighs> Conceive. Both of those songs, but for very different reasons. That's great. I was just yeah. gonna say, what what um city did we I meet you in? 
Oh, it was in San Jose. It was at the HP Pavilion, but I don't think it's called that anymore. I remember that because um, I remember that night vividly because Gaga kept saying, "I love you, San Diego," the whole show. And we were not in we were not in San Diego, so I remember that night vividly. I tried to find the photo, but like I think it's in an old email or it's on a MySpace oh. that I don't know how to log into, you know. But um, yeah, uh, amazing. But congratulations on the show and thank you so much for doing such fabulous work because I was going to be a tough critic. I was prepared to be harsh because oh. I love this movie so much, but it was really fun to watch. So, well, there, there's going to, we're already imagining things for um, season two and there are some, um, some, some tributes brewing in our brains uh, that are, that pertain to Greece too. Yay. Hey. Oh my God. Okay. It's happening. Everybody stay calm. What's the procedure, everyone? What's the procedure? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay Go! Don't dangle that carrot in front of me. <laughs> Tell all your friends to watch so we get a seat yeah. too. <laughs> thank you so much. You know, thank I've got a wrap, but thank you. Awesome. See ya. As a Japanese woman, I never thought that I would get to see a Japanese actress in a Grease series. So this is very exciting for me. Me too. Um, <laughs> sure. Yes. I know, right? So Nancy is my favorite pink lady because she has the self-confidence and acerbic wit of a middle-aged woman. Yes. <laughs> bringing her to life where does her confidence come from because none of the other teenagers are as confident as her no they're not um, i think that her confidence comes from her upbringing i think it's from her her family her parents i think they just wanted her to feel nothing but love and support especially since she is just coming out of camp like that's just what happened and and she's she's always had that support system around her and i think they wanted to shield her and make sure that even though these things were happening in the world that she was protected from that and in doing so maybe she is a little bit spoiled and maybe she is a little overconfident and maybe that's where she gets it from because she's always had the support of her family behind her and then for ari i thought that cynthia was also super confident but then we learn how terrified she is of basically everything so as the actor bringing her to life what do you believe motivates that fear she struggles with so much? Yeah, I mean, it's like hard to be a young person generally, like in any decade. <laughs> um, and then specifically to be like a young queer person without really much understanding of who you are and not much co queer community around you in the 1950s is just like a whole other level on top of that. So I think that there's certainly part of that that is that is the way that she doesn't fit in with the world. Um, and what's expected of her gender, gender wise and sexuality wise. But I also think that like, you know, all young people struggle with, with identity, all young, all, all people generally struggle with that. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's my, that, I feel like that's where Cynthia sort of like struggles a little bit um, on paper, but, but also it's sort of like the human condition <laughs> to sort of, you know, to like feel like you, to try to find where you fit and, and to, to still struggle sometimes. Both of your characters have some really fun solo musical numbers that I enjoyed. I mean, they're they're narratively doing different things, but do each of you want to share a little bit about getting to have that moment in the spotlight, working with Jamal Sims and all of that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, wow. Getting to work on World Without Boys was a dream that I never thought I could even have come true. And having that moment down the staircase, <laughs> like how grand, having my Disney princess moment down the staircase, but getting to slink. <laughs> and also like, it just, it was difficult. And I'm, I feel very proud of all of us because we were doing choreography, but then we were also asked to do things backwards and, and forwards. So sometimes I would have to learn something backwards really quickly and then just go ahead and do that even though we've been practicing it forwards or even with, the lyrics themselves and to make things so cool and slow-mo that means that I have to sing backwards in double time so that's something that I never thought I would have to do <laughs> but with the support of Justin Tranter and Jim Sims and all of that it was just an incredible collaboration and experience that I'm just so proud to be part of tiniest part of do you want to add anything Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, being a part of, like, just all of the musical numbers, like, even if I'm not, like, in the forefront, like, I am a New Cool and a few other numbers in our show, like, just being able to be a part of such an amazing triple threat cast is, like, it's not something that you get to experience very often. And um, I would say for New Cool, like, specifically, just being able to sort of pay tribute to Grease Lightning and, and Grease One was a huge thing, and then, you know, make it kind of queer and trans is, like, really just, like, a, a very spectacular for me, very important and very Thank fun. You so much. My first question is for Maxwell. Um, I'm glad that you're joining the Hall of Fame of Iconic Maxwells because the leading man here is Maxwell Caulfield. There we go. 
Hazel calls your character Wally out for his propensity for conformity and his questionable choice in friends. Was that moment ultimately what draws him to her? And if so, why? Ooh, excellent question. I definitely think that moment draws Wally to Hazel. Um, I think it opens his eyes to the vast possibilities and um, array of ways that he can go about navigating Rydell. I think he was brought up and has experienced one way of doing things and that's being a goody two shoes and doing everything by the book and kind of being um, twice as good so that he doesn't get in trouble, so that he doesn't get hit twice as hard when things go awry. Um, and I think as the story progresses, he starts to figure out how do I wanna show up at Rydell um, and how can I do that on my own terms? And Hazel inspires that in him. I'm rooting for those two. Um... I've only seen the first five episodes, so I don't know if you two get together at the end of the season, but that's what I'm hoping for. Ooh, tune in. Good to hear that. <laughs> Nicholas, I wasn't sure how I felt about Gil in episode one, but then we got to the other episodes and I saw how much he was into Olivia. And then I thought, well, he has great taste, so we can work with that. Yes. Um, what work did you do as an actor to flesh him out as a character so that you know who he is? and you know how to play him, even if we as the audience haven't fully gotten to know him as much in the first five episodes. Yeah, I think like um, throughout throughout this se season, uh, he kind of unfolds as, as all the characters do and we get to see like a lot more different sides of him. And in, in the beginning, it's a lot of like what he thinks he needs to be. Mm -hmm. Like uh, he needs to be cool, he needs to be unfazed always and like reckless and stick it to the man and like and um and then that's the whole point of the show is everyone just gets to discover themselves and where they really belong and that they don't actually have to conform to the way that things are or the way they have been and um so that was kind of like my thought process for like the this season and in terms of getting there mostly it was just kind of like letting my weird out and um feeling free to be silly and weird um because i mean that's the t-birds are like our job is to kind of like cause trouble <laughs> yep <laughs> and then of course the show has the fabulous jamal sims working on it yeah. can you share a bit with the remaining time um about the experience of working with him and getting to bring his choreography to life oh it's a dream yeah. i highly recommend it <laughs> <laughs> Jamal is a superstar. He really just imbues every move with so much soul and he puts so much thought into each musical number. Um, and he was really patient. Like, I am definitely not a trained dancer and we were surrounded by so many amazing classically trained dancers in our ensemble. And Jamal and the entire ensemble were, were so patient and giving and kind of um, teaching us the, the dance moves. Yeah. They were like, yeah, they took so much time and mm -hmm. made sure everyone felt comfortable, like no matter what their background was or experience level was. And exactly. and then kind of taught us all the choreo and said, this is what it, this is the shape of it. These are the bones. This is the structure. And then within that, once we have it, then I want your characters individually to each shine. So like, how would Gil, this is the move. How would Gil do the move? This is yeah. the move. How would Potato, how would Wally do this move? Which are really different. Like yeah. Wally and Gil would not do a time step the same. Exactly. <laughs> Nor do we. <laughs> In real life, right? <laughs> well, that's all for me today, but thank you so much for your time. And uh, I really had fun with the show. I, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel, but I actually did really like it. Had a okay, great so spirit of rebellion. So. <laughs> thank you so much. It's nice meeting you. Thank nice you meeting you. Have a great day. Chanel, Hazel is a very interesting character because she's super shy and reserved, but she does have these moments of really being able to speak her mind. So what insight can you offer into why she felt comfortable enough to call Wally out for his very poor choice in friends, no offense, um, and his propensity for That's conformity? True. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that Hazel is really, really smart and she's super observant. And so she's kind of sussing her way through the, the school at all times. She's testing out the waters all the time and seeing what situations feel safe. And I think in a situation like that, she found a common ground of like, this is another person of color at this school one of the only ones, he must know something that I don't. And so that conversation was actually really important for her to have. And so it was kind of a, a, a really cool moment for her to be like, oh, but you think you know it all, but you don't. And not in like a sassy way, but, but just for, 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 for her to turn the tables back on him because he's trying to school her and tell her he knows the, you know, the ropes. And she's like, do you? So mm -hmm. I think it's really cool. And Jason, how did you approach empathizing with Buddy as a character, even when he's conforming to a very harmful status quo? Yeah, um, I think 
for me, meeting with the writers, meeting with our showrunner, Annabelle, the thing that they hammered into me was that Buddy has a big heart. Like, no matter what, always play the big heart. He cares, and he cares. And I think the hard part is that if you read the script, you might not see that. But I think despite the fact that he keeps making these poor decisions, I think he does care. I just don't think he's figured out how to make decisions for himself and to, like, stand up for what he actually believes in. But if you keep watching, maybe he will. I don't know. And similarly for you, Madison, what work did you do as an actor internally to make Susan three-dimensional and nuanced in your mind so that you can play from her truth and perspective even when she's being very unkind to the people around her? Absolutely. Um, I had a really great conversation with our showrunner, Annabel at the beginning about making sure that Susan wasn't just the blonde mean girl. And I think this is something we explore as the season goes on. But I wanted to make sure that in, in my character work for Susan, everything that is coming out of her mouth, every decision she makes, every even snide look or disapproval that she makes comes out of like reasoning and truth that she thinks is either the best for her or her friends and that's what she's looking out for at the end of the day and I think that if you go back after seeing the entire series you might see Susan in a different light and actually realize that maybe the comments aren't as mean as you think and that there's actually a lot more um, to Susan than meets the eye and I think that's representative of the series as a whole we're Grease Rise of the Pink Ladies we're obviously a prequel series to Grease but we're a love letter to Grease but there is also so much more to, than, than just the Grease name to our show. Well, I think that's about all the time that I have, but thank you so much for your time. And I really enjoyed the spirit of rebellion that the show really encourages. So, you know, I was fully prepared to be a harsh critic and call it a cash grab if I thought that's all that it was, but it was actually really fun to watch. Oh, oh thank you. That makes us so happy to hear. <laughs>